out of DC air, you change it to DC air and show that that frequency shifts by a huge amount. And there you know that the HCL is basically what is really involved in that. There are experiments which we do where we change H2 to a deeper base for many other reasons. It's always a nice idea to keep your isotopic experiment on, change H to D, 25 to 37, so on, and so on these experiments. Because if your assignments are right, they will live to tell the truth with the isotopes. If assignments are wrong, yeah, with the isotopes, you will get spectral frequencies which don't really match up with your predictions. So if you do this experiment with this here, you will see an, a bunch of lines that 1493 will be telling you that the spectrum that we got was really for the HCL model. And as you can see, changing the lighter isotope makes a big difference. Changing the heavier isotope does not, because it's 2 out of 35. This is 1 out of 2. The relative change is much larger when you go with the DCL system. This is just a spectrum I showed you. I want to show you. This is for the HCL. It's not really a diatomic, because we have been looking at diatomics. And the, I said that I will not bother you with polyatomics in this course. But I still have to show you this. This is the HCL molecule. Linear molecule, therefore, behaves like a diatomic. So the shape is the same. Diatomic, per course, has to be linear. HCL is also linear. Level, the behavior is quite simple. And you can see the R branch, you can see the P branch, just as we saw for the HCL, everything Excuse is me, fine. But then what happens? Excuse me, sir. Sir, so can you please explain it over here? It's difficult to record. Often happens, the photographers call the shot. <laughs> so, so you see the R branch, you see the P branch, very similar to what you saw in the HCL case. But then see what happens in between here. A lot of lines here which don't seem to fall in place. You know, they are not really part of the situation system. It actually turns out that these are hot bands. You remember what we talked about hot bands? What are the hot bands? <laughs> one to two. In a purely harmonic oscillator approximation, where does the one to two come? Bang on on the zero to one. You can't even see the difference. But where does it come for the uh, an harmonic oscillator? Slightly different. But if that slightly different is not very, very different, it's very slightly different, then these two, three, 0 to 1 frequency and the 1 to uh, 0 to 1 and the 1 to 2 will actually come around the same place. And that's what happens in the case of the HCL. You get this structure over here, which is your fundamental, and all of these stuff in between, there are actually two hot bands sitting in there. It's a 1 to 2 and a 2 to 3 that's riding out here. So you can see how difficult the analysis is going to be. Because you have lines that belong to the 0 to 1 transition, you have lines that belong to the 1 to 2 transition, the lines that belong to 2 to 3 transition, all sitting out there. And it's a big mess to be able to unravel all of these and say that these lines belong to this fundamental, this line belongs to the first hot band, and this belongs to the second hot band. I will show you here to bring the aluminum hydride, the diatom. A very funny very similar happens, but in addition to that, it will have impurity band. There's a lot of lines which belong to the impurity system. It doesn't even belong to the aluminium hydride. So you can see the, the sort of difficulties that one could face in the analysis of such spectra. You might have a fundamental. You will have an overtone. You will have an impurity. Why do you have the impurity? Because the production of aluminium hydride, what they really do is to heat the aluminium in the presence of hydrogen and produce some aluminium hydride molecules and then look at the spectra. But in that process, you're probably producing some other species also. And therefore, those will show up as spectral lines. And if you're unlucky, they will have, happen to show up in about the same region where your main molecule is showing up. So you have your fundamental, you have your overtone, you have your impurities, and you have your problems. In fact, it's not all of But that's what makes the course to be that much more fun and that much more interesting because you have all these puzzles that you have to unlearn. Yes. Such, uh, R branch and P branch. So we just said that these lines are coming back, like it wasn't back, and we did not say that they were overtones. Mm -hmm. So why are we saying that these are overtones and these are not being Well, listen. As I said, these lines are still not coming back. They're still for like to let them go. These have not turned around yet. So this is still the art. Like, how do we differentiate that they're not coming back? And If these are overtones, will they belong to very high J's or very low J's? Overtones. 
they are still in the region. They, they would belong to low jails. If they are coming back, they would belong to very high jails. So do an isotope inspection and you will be able to make sure.
So the BE value essentially is going to be the rotational constant corresponding to this unrealizable level. Why am I calling it unrealizable? Because you can only get up to here or here and so on. You can't get down to here. But this is still a parameter that determines the potential for me. It tells me where the value of the potential is. And therefore, it's an extremely, extremely important parameter in deciding the shape of my potential. And therefore, I can get the value of PE from this equation. And what is alpha telling me? Alpha is the slope. Physically, what is alpha then? It's the extent of mixing between vibration and rotation. If alpha is an extremely small number, it simply tells me that BEs and BEs don't change a whole lot when I keep going from one vibration level to another. But if alpha is a big number, it actually tells me that the B is very strongly dependent on my B. In other words, alpha is essentially a parameter that talks to me about the rotational vibration mixing. And that basically is what it is. And I can get these numbers provided I have a bunch of these numbers. And where do I get these numbers? By the analysis of rotation spectra that I showed you a little while ago. So you record your spectra, you get your V0, you get your V1. Do the same thing with the hot band, you get V2. Take another hot band, you get V3 and so on. And then have V0, V1, V2, V3. Plug them. You get your VE and you get your alpha E. Alpha E tells me the extent of mixing between vibration and rotation. VE tells me of the rotational constant at R. So once I know VE, I can go back and estimate R. E. And you know how to do that. It's x square h by 8 pi square i. And i now would be mu r e squared. And therefore, starting from here, i mu r e squared for c, which is a great number. So b e, I must put r e out here. If it is b naught, what do I put? r 0. If it is b 1, I put r 1 and so on. But if I know B, I get RE, and RE is quite important because that is the minimum to the potential value. And that's an important parameter because that gives you the equilibrium bond distance as far as potential is concerned. So that's how you go back and estimate your value of B. So I could, for example, ask you give me the spectrum and ask you to estimate RE from that spectrum. Can you do that? Of course you can do that. Because if you capture B0 first, you capture B1. And from B0 and B1, you calculate BE and alpha. And from BE, you calculate your R. Lot of calculations, but you have to do it. In spectroscopy, and most of the little chemistry, you can't escape this. You have to handle quite a bit of your calculations. And this is how you will go back and estimate what the minimum of the intermediate potential is going to be, simply by looking at that spectrum which we got. So when you do these experiments later on, the HCL experiment, what, I'm, what we might ask you to do is to estimate all these parameters which have find out RE on that parameter. And which of course can be done, you know, B0 and B1. Before I go on to vibrations of polyatomic molecules, which is what I want to do next. Some of you asked me that it was not clear as to how you get your V values from low resolution experiments. You remember I told you, I sort of left it to you to go back and do it yourself. I said that if you have a low resolution data, and from this can I evaluate B? From the high resolution data, can you evaluate B? Of course I can evaluate B. I can get you B0, I can get you B1, I can get you BE and all that. But if I have a low resolution data like this, can I can I do that? Well, you can't get to B0, B1 and so on because there is really no information that I can extract out of this very, very well. But I can still get B, which is an average of each two. And how do I do that? This, let's say, is my P branch, and let's say this is my R branch. This point here, the maximum, what would that correspond to? A transition from the most probable J. What's the frequency of the R branch given by? Right? Take 
taking the simpler equation. And why am I taking the simpler equation? This vector doesn't have much resolution for me to use the V0, V1 splitting. I can't do that. So I just use the simple equation where I'm assuming that V0 and V1 can be approximated by some value V, which is intermediate between these two. I'm not making a difference between V0 and V1. I'm not differentiating between those two numbers. Therefore, I use this equation. But then what is J double prime going to be? So if I use this new frequency, new R, which is the frequency of the R branch transition, what is the frequency of the R branch transition here? It's a maximum. And I can pick out that frequency. From the experiment, I know what the wave number is at this point. But that is going to be new R max. But new R max over there is produced by what level? By the most probable J. Therefore, what do you think I must put over here? Right? We know that. So all I do is I go here and say that this is equal to omega r plus 2b root of kt by 2hcb minus a half and plus this 1. And therefore, what do I have here? I'll save myself for writing the whole thing out all over again. This is just going to be What is the P branch frequency given by? And what is J prime? I want to have everything in terms of J double prime, mind you. Why? Because the most intense transition is starting from the J double prime, which has the maximum population. So I want to write the whole equation in terms of J double prime. But what is J prime equal to for the P branch? J prime minus J double prime equal to minus 1, and then for that point equal to J prime equal to J double prime minus 1. We put that over here. Then what happens? This time. And what is the new B max when it is equal to? I have two B root of K T by two H C. So now this minus this is going to be the measured difference between this and this is an experimental measure. And therefore, when I do that, what happens? Nu r minus nu p. This would go away. And therefore, I'm going to have this 2p root of a b by a c b plus r plus, and minus will become plus and I do the subtraction. So I have 2B to KT by Simplify this. Yes? It's this minus this. So this will become plus again. This new R minus new P, right? So now when you go back and subtract these two out, so there is that minus half missing, so you will figure it out. But now if you subtract these two, I am going to get in terms of KT and HCT delta U. Delta U I can measure. I know the temperature. So what do I get from this equation now? I get B. So even though the resolution of the spectrum is very poor, I don't have enough resolution to be able to do all that I did half an hour ago. I can still use this difference and express this difference in terms of the most probable J values, which have the B in it. Therefore, go back and find out what the B value is going to be. Of course, I can't differentiate between B0 and B1, but what I can do is be able to give you an estimate of B 
that is applicable for this particular experiment. And that's how you could get it. So even if you have a low resolution data, all is not lost. You can still get estimates of B values from an analysis of this type. Here, the 
four pairs as a stir. I can therefore give you the type of movement of the molecule as it vibrates by using the pair of three in fashion. We will use this concept to address about the intensities of vibration transitions in, in molecules, which the vibration is allowed both because of the change in dipole as well as the quantum number issue. So if I take carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide, the anti-symmetric stretch has the mu over dx, dx not equal to zero. Therefore, that transition is allowed. But the question you want to ask yourself is, how much is d mu over dx? If it's extremely small, yeah, the molecule will absorb but very poorly. But if d mu over dx is very large, then of course the intensity of these transitions will be very, very large. In other words, this slope term is going to tell me a lot about what the intensities of the internal transitions are going to be. And that's what we will see next. And once you are done with that, then of course we move from now and up. Thank <laughs> you.